Hello, welcome to this Hawthorne tutorial. My name is Brandon Robinson, and I'm a member of the Hawthorne Technical Services team. The tutorial I'm presenting today is to teach the basics of using the light simulation software Dialux to create a custom light plan for your growing space. Dialux is an extremely expansive light simulation software that has been a standard in the commercial lighting industry for years. Over 75,000 architects and designers use Dialux to plan out room lighting in buildings like hospitals, museums, and offices. Although this software is designated more for the traditional lighting industry, Hawthorne's been using it for nearly five years in thousands of designs to create light plans in the horticulture space. Hawthorne has recently made all of their IES files public through Dialux. This was done to provide more tools for the growers to create and design their grow rooms. But publishing the digital files is only a part of that equation. Lighting designers within the horticulture world are not as common as in the traditional commercial lighting industry. The goal here is to give the basics of using Dialux and our fixture catalog to plan out the lighting in a room. Dialux has a huge host of features that we won't really even scratch the surface of. What I want to give you is a straight line path to drawing a room, placing lights, and calculating light levels. Beyond that, I'd suggest checking out Dialux's website for more knowledge on some of the other great features the software has to offer. If you're wondering how much all this software is going to cost, that's the best part. Both Dialux and our lighting catalog are free to download. So the only investment you have to make here is some time. While Dialux is an excellent tool that allows you to explore various lighting plans, we would recommend finalizing any light plan with a qualified expert before moving forward with execution. With that all being said, let's get started. First step is to download Dialux Evo. So we'll open a web browser, we'll go to the Dialux website, which is just dialux.com. We'll go to the download tab at the top and click on the download Dialux Evo. It'll start the download automatically. If not, just click the button and it'll start downloading this exe file. Once it's done downloading, all you have to do is click the exe file and follow the prompts to install the software. Before we get into modeling an actual room, we first want to make sure we have our standards and settings set appropriately. So we're going to go up here to File, Settings, and go to General Settings. What we want to make sure of here is that in the language settings, we have the, of course, the languages that we want. Length, you can choose a metric or imperial. And then lastly, for the sake of this tutorial and the IES files that we're using, we want to use the European system for photometric units. Everything else you can use as default as it doesn't really affect us that much. Then we're going to go to File, Settings, and we're going to go to Standards. So in Standards, again, there's a lot of stuff here that really is not, we're, we're not going to be affected by it. Um, but what we want to look at is just these items here. So first one is uniformity. This is just defining which way you want to define uniformity. So we're going to go with uh, min over average and then uh, min over max. So this is the standard that we usually use. Um, spacing to height ratio doesn't really affect us. And then lastly, the maintenance value. So we want to have a fixed value and we're gonna set it to one. I think by default, it's set to 0.8. Um, we just wanna make sure this is set to one because this value is gonna multiply against all of our calculated values that we come up with. Uh, so we just wanna make sure that we're using 100% of the fixture and not 80% of the fixture. So with that being done, we've now set all of our standards and settings and we are ready to move forward with designing out a room. All right, let's begin a new project. So we'll go to File, New Project. So this is our new project window. Uh, this is where we'll actually do the build out of the room and place our lights. So at the top, we have a couple of different categories we can work in. And on the left, we have different things we can do with those categories. So in Project, this is where you can just enter some general information about your project. This is mostly for if you're going to be creating uh, some documentation at the end. Construction. This is where we can add 
different reflectance values, build walls, build rooms, build furniture, uh, really build out the actual physical construction of the room. The light tab is where we can select the light we want to use, lay out the lights, and modify properties of the light. Then we have our calculation objects. Calculation objects is a plane we create to tell Dialux I want to know the calculation of the light levels in specifically that area. Um, construction, lighting, and calculation objects are really the three main items we're going to use in this tutorial. It's all you really need to create a, a, a light plan and figure out where you want to place the lights. Export is for if you want to export some of the stuff you create as a DWG file or create some pictures. And documentation is for creating some more professional looking documentation um, that you can send out. So with a description of all the items, let's get started with actually building out a room. The first step to building out a room is to draw the actual room itself. So this is going to involve drawing all the walls in the room. Uh, and creating the box where we're going to lay out all of our lights. So there are three ways that we can do this. We can either import a DWG file and follow the lines of that. We can import a picture that we can overlay and draw over the picture. Or we can just freehand if the shape is simple enough and we know the dimensions. So for this, we're going to start with freehand. So for freehand, we're going to go to, we're going to make sure we're in our construction tab and we're going to go to story and building construction. And we're going to click here, draw a new room. So we're going to click kind of anywhere on this, uh, on the white background, we're going to click and you see, I have a line now that I can use to create my first wall. So to choose the dimensions, we can either drag and click, or if we want to be more precise, if you click tab, you can choose between your angle and your dimension. So I'm going to go, I'm going to, go to the dimension here, and I'm going to say 40 feet. I'm going to press enter, then it's going to ask me to choose my angle, and I like where it is right now, so I'm going to press enter again. So now using the scroll wheel and zooming out to, to pan around like this, it's I'm pressing the scroll wheel and then moving from side to side. And to zoom in and out, I'm just moving the scroll wheel in and out. So then I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna say, again, I'm gonna click tab. I'm gonna go 20, enter, and 90 degrees, enter. So scroll out. Press the scroll wheel, pan up, and again, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to go 40, enter, 90 degrees, enter. Now I can either go and click to close it, or I can enter the dimension, or if I right click, you can click close polygon, and it'll finish off the shape. So now you can see we have a shape here. This is our 20 foot by 40 foot room. You can see I have walls that's automatically been created. So this is the inside of my room. This is my wall and that's the outside. On the side here, we can see some of the properties. Floor thickness, we don't really have to worry about, but story height, we can play around with. So story height just means how high the walls are gonna be. Basically, where's my ceiling gonna be with relation to the floor. So I'm going to change this to 14 feet. And now if I click up here in the 3D renders, these are the different views that I can look at. If I click on this cube, I can see my 3D representation. To rotate around in this view, I'm just holding the left click button and moving my mouse around. Everything else still supplies. Zooming is scrolling and panning from side to side is pressing the scroll wheel and moving side to side. So like this, I can look at the outside of my building. And then if I click here into room one, which I just created, I'm now inside the room. So I can kind of see 
where the walls are, where the ceiling is. So I have a nice big empty room. Great, so that's the freehand way to draw a room. Next, we're gonna do the import picture version. The second way we can go about drawing a room is to import a picture that we can trace over. Now in this tutorial, our room is pretty simple. We don't really need it, but if your room's a little bit more complicated, you can use a picture to really help find where the walls are exactly. It kind of just speeds up the process. So I can go here. So again, I'm under construction, but rather than going to draw a new, uh, new room, we're gonna click up here to plans, and we're gonna click load plan. So you would go to the folder where you have the picture of your room, and you're gonna click, uh, you're just gonna click on it. So for here, I have my sample room. So it brings in the picture, and next what we're gonna do is we are going to scale the image. So first it wants to ask you to put in a, um, put in the origin. I always skip this step because sometimes uh, if you don't click perfectly straight, it'll rotate the image a little bit. So we're just gonna click next here. We're not gonna set the origin yet. And now we're gonna specify the scale. So what this means is that you're going to click along one of these lines where you know the dimension. You're gonna click that length and then you're gonna enter the dimension and then the entire image will be scaled to that setting. So I always try to choose the largest known, uh, the largest known dimension. So sorry, the largest dimension that we know. So in this case, it's this 40 foot dimension that I have. So I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna to try to click as close to where I think that item actually ends. This is the only issue with using the images is sometimes it's hard to tell exactly, exactly where that point is. So I'm gonna click here because I think that's about where my line is. And zoom out and I'm gonna go all the way here. Try to make this line as straight as possible. Click that. So now I've set that line and now it's asking me how long is this line? So I'm gonna enter in 40 and click enter. So now we just click finish. And now if we do a check, I'm gonna take my tape measure here and I'm gonna measure this wall. Perfect, that's right about 20 feet. And same thing here, 40 feet, great. So now we do the same thing we did last time and go draw a new room. And now that I have these walls to follow, I'm just gonna follow these walls. But I'm still gonna enter my dimensions just because for this case, I know exactly where they are. And I'm gonna go 40 feet. Now the benefit of using this image is later on in the design, we're gonna have to put in some furniture, some benching. And because I've used this image where we've already kind of decided where we wanna put the benching, uh, I'll be able to reference that in the picture, put it just in the right spot. So if I look at my 3D view, you can see it's got that picture overlaid underneath it. If I go into the room, that goes away. But if I click up here, display plans, toggle that, you can see the image. So while you're working, you can toggle this image on and off. All right, let's do the last version with the using a DWG file. So for drawing a room out with a DWG file, uh, it's very similar to how we did it with a picture. So we're gonna go up to the construction tab, plans. We're gonna load a plan. And this time I'm gonna choose my sample room DWG file. So we're gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna skip putting in the origin. And now we're gonna scale the drawing. So again, we have pretty much the same thing. The only difference now is that the software actually recognizes all of these lines and it'll snap to those items. 
So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna click and you can see it kind of snapped right at that intersection because the software actually recognizes that line. And I'm gonna go down again here and I'm gonna click right on that line again. I'm gonna enter in my 40 feet. And go finish. And now if we test again, I'm gonna measure this line exactly 20 feet. Perfect. So now we do the same thing as last time. And the benefit of having the DWG, toggle that on, is that when you go to draw the room, like we did previously, the difference here is that again, everything's gonna snap. So I, you can see when I move my mouse, it, it snaps to that line. So I can very quickly just click on those corners without having to enter in the dimensions. It goes very quick. Again, with a room this size, it doesn't really make a huge difference, but when you have a more complex room with maybe extra walls and inputs, uh, it speeds up the process of creating this room. So again, we go to our 3D. You can see the lines of the benching that I have on the inside. And again, I can still toggle this on and off. All right. With our room drawn, we can now start laying out the benching in the room. So first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna go into my top down view and I'm gonna click on the room tab. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna to toggle on my drawing so I can see where my benches are. We're then gonna make sure we're in the construction tab and we're gonna go down to the furniture and objects. So in here, there's a bunch of different ways we can put in benching. If you already have 3D files, um, you could import benches, things like that. But for here, we're just gonna do a simple uh, 3D representation of a bench. And to do that, we're gonna go to Draw Extrusion Body. So I'm gonna click Draw Extrusion Body, and I'm gonna zoom in. And we're gonna click on the corner here. Now this is very similar to building the actual room itself. I'm gonna click the corner, drag across, click the next corner. You can see at the top there, it gives you the dimension. So this bench here is four feet. You can do the same thing like we did in the room. You can click tab and enter in the dimensions. So four feet, enter, enter. And then I'm gonna drag down here, click my other corner, my other corner and close the polygon. So you can see this is now a black line. So we know that it's actually uh, an item in the room, but to get a better idea, we can click the 3D view. And you can see we've got a bench now. So on the left here, we have different properties of the bench. We have the position, rotation, and the size. This is all based on X, Y, Z axis. So X being this red arrow, Y being the green arrow, and Z being the blue arrow. Meaning that I could move this around, say if I put in four, you can see it shifts a little bit that way. Or if I put in 25, you can see it shift backward. And if I put in let's say five feet, you can see it's raised five feet in the air. You could also just click move and you can grab the arrows, move it around. And in the top down view, you can do the same thing just without the Z axis. So I'm just gonna control Z, undo all those movements and get it back to where it was. Perfect, so I'm back on the line. You could also rotate. So say if the room was oriented the other way, I could put in 90 degrees on the Z-axis and rotate it 90 degrees. Lastly, we have the actual size. So because this is a rectangle, or sorry, a rectangular prism, you've got your X, Y, and Z for dimensions. So my X and Y is good because I know I traced that on the line, but for the height, these benches are a little bit higher than what I had in mind. So I'm gonna change these to one and a half foot bench height. There we go. So that is the representation of my bench. 
So that's exactly where I want it to be. So now I'm gonna switch back to my top down view. I'm gonna click on the bench. I'm gonna right click. I'm gonna click copy. And then just like a word file, I'm gonna go control V, paste. And you can see something highlighted. So what actually just happened there is I copied in or I pasted in a new bench. So now I can move this down and I'm gonna fill these in. Control C, Control V, Control C, Control V. There we go. Putting in all my benching. If I go to my 3D view, there we go. So my benching and room is now built. Next step here is we're going to apply some reflectance values. While still in the construction tab, we're gonna move down to this item here titled materials. So in here, we can set uh, different textured materials and reflection values. Textures and materials is if you wanted to do like a really nice 3D render where the building actually looks like it would look like in real life, you could do that. Um, but for the case of just figuring out calculation values, we only really need to apply the reflectance values to the different surfaces. So we need to apply materials to the walls, the floor, the ceiling, and the benching. So I'm gonna start with the benching. I'm gonna go click here to, uh, sorry, I'm gonna pick material, and I'm gonna click on the top of my bench. So you'll see at the bottom, we have reflection factor set to 70%. So for this case, I'm gonna change it to 10%. For most cases, knowing the exact reflectance value of your bench is not really necessary. The reason being is because we're trying to figure out the light levels based on when the room is full of plants. To replicate that, we set the bench reflectance value to 10%, as we found that when comparing simulation light levels to real world measurements, this 10% value does a great job of recreating a green canopy. If you're, uh, if you're designing for a crop that has spacing that leaves a lot of bench area visible, you might want to change that value to better reflect what the bench reflectivity really is. You could also add in plant models, but this can be extremely taxing on the software because it creates a ton of faces and surfaces the software will have to render. And from experiments I've run, the results really aren't that much different. So this 10% represents more the canopy, more so than the actual bench value itself. So with that 10%, I'm gonna click apply material and I'm just gonna drag and apply this material everywhere. Um, you can do every little crevice of the bench on each side. To be honest, it doesn't really affect the values too much or really at all. But for the sake of this tutorial, let's just apply it everywhere. But what's really important is just getting the top of the bench. All right, so now our benches are all at 10% reflectivity. And next I'm going to go to, uh, ne next I have to apply my materials to my walls, ceilings, and floors. So Dialux has made this very easy. We can do change reflectance of room surfaces, and we do this all in one shot. So ceiling, walls, and floors. So for us, our standard is usually 50% for ceilings, 90% for walls, and 10% for floors. Again, for us, we usually deal with a lot of clients that are using the highly reflective fridge panels. Um, ceiling generally it, it can change a lot. It doesn't have a massive, massive effect on the overall. But again, from doing these uh, designs a lot, we've really found that 50% uh, usually is a good value to work with. And then floors, 10%. Again, because we're assuming the area where we have, um, where, where we're calculating, is really just covered by canopy. Now, another way that you could do this is you could change the floor to, you know, whatever reflectance value you think it is, say, let's say 60%, and then we could draw another 3D figure of what we think the canopy would kind of look like, 
and then apply the reflectance values to that. This is a way that you could do it. Honestly, we have found that using this 10% value um, works extremely well um, and you know, kind of speeds things up the most because the more items that we put into this room, the harder the calculation gets. So we've now set all of our reflectance factors uh, for all of our surfaces. Next up is we're gonna create the calculation plane that's gonna go across the bench to tell Dialux, here's where I wanna know the light levels. So with our benching made, our reflectance values put in, we're now gonna move to creating our calculation object. So we're gonna switch over to this tab here, calculation objects. So what a calculation object is, is it's a plane 2D plane we're gonna create where we tell Dialux, I wanna know what the light levels are in this area. So if we move to the floor plan view, we are going to now go to draw rectangular uh, calculation object. And we're in the um, calculation objects tab here. So I'm gonna click that. And just like drawing a room, I'm gonna click on the corners. and I'm gonna go across my entire bench, right? So the idea being that I really just wanna know the light levels across where my canopy is. Now, if you clicked and maybe it didn't catch the edge properly, like I can see here, it's off a little bit. It doesn't make a huge difference, but you can right click, go to edit polygon, and you can just adjust this a little bit. So I'm gonna move it in so it's right on the line. Same thing here, move it just so it falls right on the line. All right, so we have this yellow plane and when we click on it, we can see there's all these dots. So every one of those dots, when we do a calculation, Dialux is gonna give us what the value is at that dot. If I go in my 3D view, I can see my calculation plane is on the ground right now. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to positioning and I'm gonna change the height. So where should I be putting this? Our standard practice is to give two calculation planes, one at the level of what we think the crop is gonna be when it first comes into the room, and the second is going to be the height at which we think the, the plant is gonna finish at in the room. So let's check. So if my bench is one and a half feet high, I'm gonna say that my plant comes in, they usually start about one and a half feet tall. So I'm gonna put this at three feet from the floor. So I can see I'm gonna be taking the calculations of the light levels at three feet from the floor which in this case means that they're one and a half feet from my bench. Space, we don't have to change anything in here. So the next thing that's pretty important is setting the measure measuring grid, right? If I look at these dots, they're spaced pretty far apart. And if I do a calculation, it might not be the best representation because maybe the light level drops in between these two dots. So what we can do is we can go down here to distance and we can set the distance that we want between each dot. So let's say I changed to, so right now you can see at three and a half feet between each dot on the X axis and three and a half feet between each dot on the Y axis. So I'm gonna change this to one foot and one foot. So you can see I have a lot more calculation points and this is gonna be a better representation of the room. The only thing that we have to consider is that the more dots that I create, the more difficult the calculation is, meaning that the calculation, uh, it, your computer's gonna work a little bit harder and it might take a little longer. So for the sake of this, we're gonna do one and a half feet. I find one and a half feet is a really good value. It gives a good representation of the room in terms of uh, you know, I don't think necessarily that we can have a big, you know, have a high value here, a low value here, and a high value here. 
Um, and it also, so it's, it's just a good covering of the room. As our rooms get bigger and bigger, we might change these spacings to get bigger and bigger as well so that our rendering time doesn't take as long. This will kind of be up to you to decide what you think is a good representation of calculation points uh, across a room. Um, like I said though, for this we're going to use one and a half feet by one and a half feet. Um, next ISO lines, we don't have to do anything here. And value chart settings, uh, we'll, do, we'll change some settings here once we do an actual calculation. So from here I'm going to go to the properties tab and I'm going to change the name to starting canopy and sometimes I like to make a note three feet from floor all right and now if I go to my floor plan view click on this and then go control C control V I've now created a new plane and I'm gonna call this one finishing canopy and I'm going to change the position from three feet to let's call it five and a half feet and if I go to my 3d view you can see I have two calculation planes now my finishing canopy which I'll actually change this to five and a half feet as the name at a position of five and a half feet and I have this bottom plane at a height of three feet called starting canopy. And if I click on the right here to results overview, you can see I have these two canopies, or sorry, these two calculation planes set up ready to go. All right, we have both of our calculation planes that we need. Next up is to move into actually uh, putting in the lights and figuring out their best position. So now we have to put the actual lights into the room. How do we go about doing that? Where do we get these light files that represent the different fixtures we want to try out? Well, for Hawthorne, we've made this really easy for people using this software. We have a catalog built within Dialux that has all of our fixtures with all of our IES files, which are the um, files that represent the light distribution of the fixture. Um, and these IES files are embedded into 3D models that are very nicely represented in the room. So to use it, all you have to do is click on this uh, button up here, Brands. And down here, I've already typed it in, but you would just put in Hawthorne. And our catalog um, link will come up here. So there are two ways you can get to the catalog. You could either download the product catalog, which will give you something that you install into your computer. And when you install it, you would get this. So this is a catalog that you can click the fixture that you want. So we have our CT1930, 1700E. We have fixtures from our Lux brand, as well as Sun System. So you choose any light that you want. So for the sake of this tutorial, I'm gonna do something with the CT1930. You click details, read a little bit about the fixture, or if you wanted to search some things, maybe you know you can only work on uh, 347 volt for my Canadian friends, uh, and I wanna look only at Guvita. Then it would give you the fixtures that you could use on those voltages. So let's go back to everything. I'm gonna grab the CT1930, and I click here, send to Dialux. And as you can see, the CT1930 has now populated as the fixture that I'm working with. Alternatively, if you don't want to install something else onto your computer, you could use Start Product Catalog Online. You click that, and it'll bring up a browser. And the browser has exactly our same catalog, um, just not as a downloadable client. So a little bit easier to use, uh, you know, if you just don't want to install something else on your uh, computer. But same thing, you choose the fixture you want. So let's say we're doing with the 1700E. Send to Dialux. 
Click here, the 1700E is now chosen as the fixture I want to work with. So a couple things to note with these files. Normally fixture files um, are presented in lumens. Um, everything is measured in lumens and in within the commercial lighting industry they use lumens as the you know light levels that we see. In horticulture we use something called PPF or photosynthetic photon flux and we measure the light in photosynthetic photon flux density. So this is one of the areas where the horticulture lighting industry and the commercial lighting industry have a little bit of a disconnect. So to make this easier for people, because there is no real direct conversion from lumens to uh, PPF, because that conversion is dependent on the spectrum. If I have more red, then that's a different conversion if than if, my, uh, than if my spectrum is very blue. So every fixture has its own conversion. So what we've done is instead of having these files in lumens and then having to find your conversion factor and then multiplying it on a calculator or something, every one of these files already has PPF or photosynthetic photon flux as its base of measurement. And what that means is that when we use Dialux, and we get a calculation, and in the end you'll, you'll see over here it'll fill what the value is, it won't be lux or uh, foot candles, it'll actually be PPFD. So the measurement that you would read if you were using a PPFD meter on site. So any values that you get here, just remember, even though it says lumens or it says lux, these are PPF and PPFD values. So. With that said, let's grab our fixture. So for this case, we were gonna use the 1930E. And I'm gonna send it to Dialux. All right, let's get started placing these lights. All right, now it's time to get into the real exciting part of this tutorial, and that's the actual light planning. So from our Hawthorne catalog, we chose chosen the CT1930, and we're gonna get to laying out the lights. So we're gonna start in our floor plan view. With this fixture selected, we're gonna go to draw a rectangular arrangement. I'm gonna create a square or a rectangle across my benching area. Automatically, the software has created a arrangement of lights. So where do we start? How do we decide how many lights to even start with putting in? Well, to get a starting point, we can use a feature in Dialux called the Estimate Calculator. Now remember that all these lux and lumen values for us are actually representing PPFD because the actual IS files or the digital files that are embedded into these fixtures are based on photosynthetic photon flux and not lumens. So what we're going to do is we're going to say our target for this room is a thousand PPFD or our target for this area that I've highlighted is a thousand PPFD. So I highlight here, I put in a thousand, and I click apply again. So what this has done is it's put in the amount of fixtures it believes would be required to get an average of a thousand PPFD across this, uh, across this plane. Now we know we not, might not necessarily be the best layout in terms of the uniformity, but at least we get an idea of roughly how many fixtures we're gonna need. So in this case, it says we need about 36 fixtures and it's arranged them in a row, uh, in a pattern of six rows of six fixtures. This gives us about uh, 5.8 feet between each row and about 2.9 feet between each fixture. So from here, we can then play with the height. <clears throat> Let's go into our 3D view. And you can see this has automatically put the fixtures pretty much at the top of the room. Now, 
I know from experience that if I'm aiming for about a thousand PPFD with this particular fixture, hanging them at about two and a half to three feet from the mature canopy is where I want to be. So if my calculation plane is at five and a half feet, I'm going to put these fixtures at about eight and a half feet to start. So eight and a half feet. And we can now see it's lower down. I also know from experience, I generally like to have these lights laid out so that there's fewer rows of Unistrut just to make my installation easier. So to start, I'm going to rotate these. And I'm going to shift it so I have fewer unistruts, but still aiming to get about 36 fixtures. So I'm going to say, let's go with five rows of seven. Oops, wrong way. Five rows, seven fixtures per row. So we're at 35 fixtures. And I know if I don't put these lights over here, I'm gonna get kind of a drop off of light. So I'm gonna pull. So what I can do, actually instead of pulling, is we can play with these features a little bit. So over here, this is just telling where you want to align the fixtures with relation to this bounding box. So if I click here, where it says it's gonna put the edge of the fixture on the edge of the box, you can see on the red line, it's pushing all the fixtures so that they hit the edge of the box. Or if I click here, it puts them on the edge. So to start, we're actually just gonna go with this. We're gonna do a calculation. We're gonna see the results that it gives. And then we'll make adjustments from there of how we think we can improve it. So just to double check, we got our two calculation planes, we've set our, ref our reflectance values, and we've done an initial layout of lights. So we'll go up here, and I'm going to do start calculation. Now depending on your computer, this can take a long time, it can take a short amount of time, and like I said, the more calculation points and the more fixtures that you have in a room, the longer this is going to take. So we got our first results. So let's take a look on the right here. So for our mature or finishing canopy, I got 1000 PPFD with a uniformity of 60% and my starting canopy is at 950 PPFD with 61% uniformity. So we're at about the light level target that we want, but our uniformity is extremely low. So uniformity is defined as the lowest calculation point divided by the average. So if we do a breakdown here, so our average is 1070, meaning it's added up all of these calculation points and divided it by the number of calculation points. And then we have our minimum point, which is at 639. So we can see all the calculation points here. And so the idea with uniformity is we want our min to be as close to our average as possible so that there's the least amount of variance from one area of the canopy to the next. So an easier way to visualize kind of where we're seeing the drop off rather than just reading every individual number, we can click on the calculation plane. So we'll click calculation objects, we'll click on the plane, so the finishing canopy, and I'll click here, delete diagram. So it's gonna take away all of the kind of overlays and I'm going to choose two things, value chart, so it gives me the actual value of each point, and false color. What false color does is it gives a color associated to a range. And if we look down here, we can see that between you know, 750 PPFD to 999, it'll be yellow. And then from 1000 PPFD to 2000 PPFD, it's going to be this beige color. So this helps us really quickly see, oh, the edges of my canopy, that light level is really starting to drop. So to fix this, I'm going to click on the fixtures. So I'm going to click on light again. I've always got to be in the tab of the item I want to use to click on it. So I'm going to click light. I'm going to click on my array. And I'm going to try pushing these all the way out to the edge. 
So I'm making a modification and I've done a calculation. So it's just telling me that all these calculations will now be invalid. So do I want to continue? Yes. So I'm going to push those all the way to the edge. And I can see that on the top and bottom, I'm also getting a, a light drop off. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to push those all the way to the edge. Now I know from experience that when I have no wall that's close by, I don't get a lot of reflectance value. So I generally have to pull these down a little bit extra to make sure that I get a uniformity. The other thing that I know is that these fixtures, they like to throw their light out wide. And the way that I can see that is if I go to my 3D view, look at my fixtures, and we go up to this here, display options, and I click on this, show light distribution curves, and then I click on the light. This gives you an idea of how the light fixture throws the light. So if you look, it does a little bit of a bubble this way, but if I look at it head on, you can see it likes to throw the light really wide. So what that tells me is that my spacing from here to here, from Unistrut to Unistrut, should be greater than my distance from this fixture to this fixture, because I throw wide this way, but I don't throw wide that way. So what I'm gonna do is, again, I'm gonna change the amount of Unistruts that I have, or, or rows that I have. I'm gonna bring it down to six, and I'm gonna change this to wrong way again. So I'm going to bring this down to four and this up to eight. So that gets me to 32 fixtures, 36 fixtures. There we go. So four rows of nine fixtures per row. And if I look at the spacing, over here so I've got about 5.6 from fixture to fixture and 4.2 from fixture to fixture that way all right so I'm still at the same height I've rearranged some things let's give this a try all right we got our new values so let's take a look all right, 979 is my average PPFD across the canopy. And my uniformity is extremely high at 93%. So if I take a look from the top, now it looks a little splotchy here. You can see I'm going from yellow to, to, the, uh, to the beige quite a bit. But if I really look at the values, that transition from yellow to beige is at a thousand PPFD. And right here, I only have a difference of about 20, or sorry, about 15 PPFD, which is why I'm seeing that change. But in reality, my uniformity is really high. So this is great. To visualize this a little bit better, I can play with the scale so that it makes more sense. So let's say my average is about a thousand. If I go 10% above that, that's 1,100. One thousand one hundred. And below is uh, 900. And this was at 1,100. So what this is doing is that Anything between 900 PPFD and 1,100 PPFD, which is a 10% plus or minus from my average, is gonna be that beige color. And when we do that, we can see everything within this canopy is plus or minus 10% of the average. So there's very little variance. So 979, that's a good value. But if the cust you know, if you're thinking maybe I want to have a little bit headroom or I want to make sure that I'm really above a thousand PPFD all the time, I think this pattern works really well. So all I'm going to do is just add in one more fixture per row. Check out that pattern, 
and I'm going to run the entire project. There we go, we're still at 91% uniformity, and, but this time I'm at about 1100 PPFD. Again, we see those weird transitions, but that's because we just need to adjust our scale to plus or minus 10%. So that would be about 1200 PPFD and about 1000 PPFD, somewhere in that area. So you can see I got, you know, my low spots are just at the back there, but that's not too bad. And there you have it. We now have our light plan for this room. So I can click here. I can see that I have 40 fixtures, four rows of 10. I've spaced the fixtures 3.75 from center to center and from row to row of 5.6 feet from center to center. You can also use the measuring tape to see that I'm about one foot away from this fixture here, from this wall. And same thing, I'm about just about a foot away from this wall as well. Now the plan that I have here is a good plan, but doesn't necessarily make it the best plan. Maybe I don't care that much about uniformity and I'd rather have a higher PPFD value. Well, in that case, I could pull everything in a little bit and sacrifice some uniformity and then maybe get rid of one light. So by pulling everything in, I'm gonna increase the value of everything here, but I'm gonna have a drop off on the edge. So again, I'm still at a thousand PPFD average, but my uniformity has dropped to 82%. And you can see that the canopy on the edges is lower than what's on the inside. So this is a balance that we always have to play with of uniformity and total light level. And we have to work between the both, the both of them to find what makes the most sense for your particular crop and your particular goals. So we could keep on playing with this design if we wanted to. We could raise the fixture up, see how that affects things. We could lower way down, see how close we could get to the, to the canopy before we start seeing large separations of uniformity between fixtures. But ultimately for me right now, I know that a 93% uniformity at the target that I want, it's not really gonna get much better than that. So with that, the last thing we can touch on is just a little bit of the documentation. If you click on this page, there's a whole bunch of different pages that you can generate for a report, showing you know renderings of what the room looks like, uh, a summary of the fixtures being used in the facility. But I think the most popular thing that most of the users here are going to want to see is this section, the luminaire uh, layout plan. What this gives is a numbering off of the fixtures that are in the room. And then on the pages down here, the XYZ coordinates of each one of those fixtures in reference to the origin that you set originally. So with this on hand, you can go to your room, start installing your fixtures. Thanks everyone for tuning into this video. I hope you found it useful. As I mentioned at the beginning, the methods I've provided here are really just the basics of doing a light plan. But for many growers, this will provide them with everything they need to get the job done. For more advanced or larger scaled commercial plans, we always recommend reaching out to our sales team. You can reach out through the Hawthorne website. For more information on Dialux, please visit their website and YouTube page. They have a host of tutorials, FAQs, and forums. We at Hawthorne are dedicated to providing growers with all the tools they need to build out a great grow room. We hope to hear from you in the comments and let us know if you'd like to see more content like this.